All right, I think it's it's time to start. Um, so first of all, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome everyone in the name of the Leo Beck Institute to the first session of our 2023 lecture series, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, Myths, Images and Imaginings about Jews. My name is Kinga Bloch and I'm the Deputy Director of the LBI London. And like you all, I'm greatly looking forward to Professor, Professor Kathy Galvin's talk on gender, sex and Jewishness in Weimar Cinema's Monsters. First and foremost though, I would like to apologize for having to move from a hybrid event to an online format at such short notice. And I hope you will forgive us um, any improvisations that might occur as a result of that unexpected switch. We are sadly all aware of the hazardous weather conditions which have descended on many parts of the UK and due to severe weather warnings and considerable travel disruptions, Professor, Professor Cathy Galvin could not travel from Manchester to London to deliver her lecture in person at the GHI. Luckily, and thanks to the blessings of modern technology, we can all attend the event online, even though it would have indeed been much nicer to be in the same room with all of you. Before I briefly go into greater detail about tonight's event, just a quick word about the format of the Zoom event. After a brief introduction of our speaker, Professor Galbin's lecture will be followed by a Q&A session and everyone attending will be able to ask questions following the presentation. I will share the detailed instructions for participating in this Q&A after Cathy's talk. So about the lecture series. It is organized jointly by the LBI and the German Historical Institute, and it is always a great pleasure and an honor for us to work with the GHI. I'm very happy to let the Institute's director, Professor Christina von Hodenberg, extend her welcome to you now. So to you, Christina. Yes, hello, a warm welcome from me as well, uh, from the German Historical Institute at Bloomsbury Square here in, here in London. Normally, we would be delighted to welcome you into our beautiful conference room. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to this new lecture series of the LBI in cooperation with us, which has a lot, of, uh, lot to do with ideals of beauty and power uh, that we just discussed before the lecture started. Uh, and uh, I'm Greatly looking forward to Kathy Galbin's lecture. Um, it's, a, it's a pity that we can't welcome you at the square in the building today, but I hope we can next time and for the other events in this series. And um, that's, that's it from me. I want to keep it short and let's get to the exciting bit of the evening, which is the lecture. And thank you, uh, Kathy, for agreeing to give a lecture for us. Um, yeah, thank you, Christina, and um, as ever, thanks to the team at the German Historical Institute. Um, as you know, we are always very much looking forward to all of our joint events, and we are grateful for your continued support and also for our long longstanding, um, if I may say so, very successful collaboration. I hope that the weather will be more friendly towards our common endeavors in the future so we can meet in person again soon. Now, let me now give a brief introduction to the topic of our lecture series, as it's the first session in the 2023 series tonight, and of course, to tonight's speaker, Professor Kathy Galbin. This year's lecture series is titled The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, Myths, Images and Imaginings about Jews. Our lectures this year will explore the complex connections and entanglements between visual narratives and ideas of beauty, ugliness, and morality that are inherent to representations of Jews and Jewishness in the Western world. The topical range of this year's contributions is very wide, and we aim to examine the subject from different historical, social, and artistic perspectives, ranging from medieval mythology to Orientalism, Zionism, feminism, just to name a few. Our speakers will explore a selection of diverse media such as painting, photography, film and comics. Superficially, ideas about beauty and ugliness appear to refer to physical markers. The aesthetic categories that a society creates around those are, however, always highly political vehicles that translate ideas about bodies into devices to navigate ideas about morality. Ultimately, myths, 
images and imaginings about Jews have been applied in the negotiation of inclusion or exclusion, or in other words, in defining who is part of either the good, the bad, or the ugly. Tonight's lecture will explore a very specific manifestation of, we may say, ugliness, reflecting about Weimar cinema's monsters in the context of gender, sexuality, and Jewishness. And everyone here is very honored to welcome the renowned film historian and cultural studies scholar, Professor Kathy Gelvin today. Her academic work in the field of German Jewish history and culture is seminal in many respects. She has contributed to the exploration of visual narratives in German speaking Jewish culture and Holocaust representation, engaging with various media, such as feature film, video testimony, literary texts, and live art. It is indeed very, very hard to reduce her work to a very few short opening words. So please forgive me, Kathy, and please forgive me, dear guests, if I can only give a very condensed overview today. Kathy Gelbin is Professor of Film and German Studies at Manchester University. Her specialization is German Jewish culture, Holocaust studies, gender, and film. Her career has taken her to a wide range of international destinations in Britain, Israel, and Germany, including, just to name a few here, the Moses Mendelssohn Center for European Jewish Studies at the University of Potsdam, the Bukirius Institute at the University of Haifa, and the Leibniz Institute for Jewish History and Culture, Simon Dubno, in Leipzig. Kathy Gelbin was involved in many groundbreaking research activities, such as the co-coordination of the first German Holocaust video testimony project, Archiv der Erinnerung, Archive of Memory. This project ran in collaboration with the Fortunov Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University. Kathy Gelbin, and this is much closer to home, is also one of the co-editors of the Leo Beck Institute Yearbook for the Study of German Jewish History and Culture, published by Oxford University, and she serves, among other functions, on the Board of Directors and Trustees of the Leo Beck Institute London. Now, before I give the stage, hand it over to um, Kathy, let me give you three examples from Kathy's truly diverse portfolio of groundbreaking academic publications. The first one is The Golem Returns from German Romantic Literature to Global Jewish Culture that was published in 2011. This publication inquires into the role that popular culture has played in the formation of modern Jewish culture, using the journey of the Jewish folktale figure Golem as a case in point. The process of, golems, of the Golem's translation into its manifold manifestations in pop culture is read from a new angle here, seeing it as the product of the complex cultural interaction between Jews and non-Jews since the early modern period. Another very broad study with, different topic, with a different topical focus is the co-edited volume, Jewish Culture in the Age of Globalization, that Kathy Galvin has published in 2014 in collaboration with Sander Gilman. This interdisciplinary anthology explores the impact of current globalization processes on Jewish communities across the globe and intends to begin a process of investigation into 21st century Jewish identity. In one of her most recent publications, Professor Galvin turns to Queer Jewish Lives on Screen, which is also the title of a recent article published in Jewish Culture and History. This piece explores representations of queerness and Jewishness in international movie productions spanning over four decades, starting with Barbara Streisand's epic performance in Yentl from 1983 until more recent films such as Orphe Raoul Grazer's The Cake Maker. This article is an excellent device to navigate the complex developments in the cinematic exploration of queerness in diverse Jewish communities. Now, I could continue for a very long time now, and um, I could point out many other publications and projects here and probably fill the evening in just doing so, but I'd rather hand over to Professor Kathy Gelbin herself now. So I'm very happy, Kathy, to hand the stage and the screen over to you and let you speak about your fascinating topic tonight. 
thanks, uh, Kinga, for your very, very kind uh, introduction. And thanks to Karina and to you and to Christina for inviting me and for letting me speak to you um, this evening. Yes, it would have been lovely to join you in London in person, and I hope to do so in the near future. Um, yes, uh, the, the topic I'm going to talk to you about tonight, uh, in a way, spans different aspects of the, the work that Kinga has mentioned. So it, it will start with the golem and then sort of um, continue on to things that have been concerning me more recently uh, in respect to German cinema, early German cinema more broadly, um, and, and queer representations in film, um, which I've also looked at in this piece that Kinga just mentioned. So it kind of brings together um, various aspects of um, the work that I've done uh, over a number of years. Um, yes, so I'd like to talk to you about um, monsters and um, in, I think what I'm going to do, because I have some film clips, um, I normally would have uh, had the PowerPoint slides while I was speaking, but I think what that means is that you would see slides and you wouldn't see me. So I think I'll start maybe sharing my screen when I get to the clips and maybe give my introduction so you can uh, see me while I'm speaking rather than, um, yes, a very um, evocative um, slide of Nosferatu, the, the monster, but I will, I will bring that up when I get to my clips. Uh, so one thing that's fascinated me uh, for a number of years is uh, cin cinema monsters in early German cinema, starting in fact with the golem and then um, reaching out to, uh, to other uh, kinds of uh, film monsters and the Jewish connotations that these film monsters have frequently had, um, but not just the, the Jewish connotations, but also the queer connotations and the um, ideas of sexual transgression, which these monsters often uh, seem to embody. And that has uh, fascinated me for quite a while. Again, obviously bringing together the different uh, um, broader topics I'm interested in, gender, sexuality, and uh, race, and the way in which they, they intersect, intersect, but also interact. So they don't always neatly intersect. They're, they are also separate uh, meanings that can stand in uneasy tension. And I found these tensions um, particularly prevalent in the monsters because they're, of course, uh, figures that are meant to scare us. Monsters are warning signs. Monstrara in Latin means to kind of signpost, to warn, and these monsters are meant to warn us of transgressions, obviously, that uh, we aren't really supposed to uh, commit. And at the same time, um, there is something so incredibly fascinating about the ways in which these cinema monsters in um, the Weimar era uh, were presented that we keep watching these films. And that's uh, what I found uh, interesting is what is it about these monsters that kind of makes them so fascinating that we, in fact, even though we recognize the anti-Semitic, uh, often homophobic connotations of these monsters, we kind of still, we still love them, we still enjoy them. And that's why these films have become uh, classics. Uh, so I'm interested in the peculiar fascination of these um, um, intersecting images in the monster, which I want to explore uh, by interrogating precisely those uh, intersections, um, both as kind of separate meanings that stand kind of parallel to each other, but also as intersecting meanings that create tensions and um, also um, uh, an eroticized kind of fat fascination uh, with these images. Uh, and I found that particularly uh, difficult maybe to argue in the case of Nosferatu the Vampire, because even though I, it's a film I find extremely fascinating and I find its um, homoerotic connotations um, very uh, fascinating, it is also a very troubling film because it seems to be much more clearly than anything else an anti-Semitic representation of um, or an anti-Semitic representation through the vampire, which at the same time is, is rendered ambivalent and fascinating through the, the sexualized connotation which this figure is given. So that led me to kind of uh, delve more deeply into this uh, topic and to not sort of try to neatly collapse these meanings uh, into each other. Um, so um, yes, I want to look at the lasting fascination of these films, which I would argue um, result from the ironic interplay of these also troubling meanings at the same time. Um, so when these meanings are made to overlap in an intersectional way, gender, gender sexuality, and race, 
um, being sometimes mapped at the same time onto the same signifier, but also span separately. That's where there we can argue that there are gaps opening up, which allow for spectatorial pleasure. This is a filmic term, um, which can arise from these gaps and which can also interrogate or draw into question or at least render ambivalent the biologized discourses of the time precisely on gender, sexuality, and race. So Weimar cinema and the monster has often been read or the Weimar fascination with the monster as a response to the cat catastrophic ending of World War I, which was also the commercial watershed of German film. Um, and these films with their often distorted camera angles, their very um, emotive chiaroscuro lighting effects seem to speak to the sense of damage uh, through the war, um, which uh, the war had wrecked on, wreaked on both human bodies and on minds and on the fabric of German society uh, in general. And uh, there was on the one hand, this was a period of rapid technological progress, um, which um, seemed to kind of hold the promise for a, a, a more fair um, society, a more equal society, um, and which was quite optimistically received um, in European societies more broadly. Uh, but at the same time, it was also a source of fear um, because it seemed to blur the distinction between humans and machines in the cyborg, for example, we might think of Metropolis here, another film monster of the period. Um, and so it was both a sign of, of terror and of fear, but also of the promise, the utopian promise of social justice and change. change, And these are precisely the dichotomies, some of the dichotomies which are captured in these films, themes which focused on the mythical and the bizarre, on madness and the monster, on the vampire or the artificial anthropoid, and negotiated through these artificial human figures, the ambivalent discourses on racialized, gender gendered, and sexualized difference during the Weimar era. But of course, um, they, in doing that, also drew on a long history of imagining the monster. And that's something I delved into more deeply in my work on the golem, um, which is a figure that is located back into the medieval period, but really didn't become a figure of the popular imagination so much, kind of the broader popular imagination and the literary sphere until um, early modernity. But um, in the late 18th century, then beginning with um, British and German romanticisms and the British Gothic on undead Jews, um, undead animated statues and artificial creations, monsters began to signify the disturbance that modernity meant in a world order that was previously seen as God-given and natural. And so Monsters kind of, again, as warning signs, uh, suggest the dangers uh, which the advent of modernity um, seemed to pose to this older conception of um, the world as a natural and God-given entity. Um, so these separate and yet intertwined discourses of race, gender, and sexuality in the monster seem to stand in juxtaposition to each other, but also amplify and disturb each other. Um, and one very prevalent argument about monsters, an early argument about uh, these monsters in Weimar cinema, which many may be uh, familiar with, is the argument of the film historian Siegfried Krakauer, who read them as uh, signs of the advent of national socialism, which is undoubtedly a, a meaning that is present in these monsters. Um, Krakow read them as um, symbols of the, the rising uh, dictatorship and of national socialism, um, but um, read only or solely in that way, um, though such interpretations can't, I would say, capture our ongoing fascination um, with these monsters, um, because at the same time, they also signpost the, the kind of new freedoms um, of the Weimar Republic, um, the rise of the women's movement, um, the um, growing integration and equality of Jews in, 
Weimar society, the period when Jews for the first time felt themselves to be fully part of German culture and society in this brief period between the two world wars. And of course, also a period in which the, as it was called in the language of the time, the homosexual rights movement was making um, inroads and was making important advances. And of course, one of the struggles of that movement at the time was, and for a long time after that was the struggle against the uh, clause, the legal clause uh, 175, which forbade um, um, sexual contact among, among men and made that a, a criminal deed. So these um, kind of um, egalitarian movements um, interacted also at the same time with the kind of rise of national socialism. And if we think of the monsters as these ambivalent figures uh, negotiating these, these different um, tensions in German society, I think we arrive at a more complex appreciation um, of their ongoing fascination. Uh, perhaps a word on the uh, long-standing link between early German film, uh, the discipline of sexology and the Jews, and this kind of fits into the importance also of uh, the monsters signposting the new sexual freedoms of the era. Um, film played a very important role in that period in uh, conveying the repressed and covert meanings of uh, or, or related to sexuality and even more particularly maybe to, um, to homosexuality in the language of the time or queerness as we would call it na nowadays. Um, but this was not just a, and, and kind of linked these um, often in the film monsters again to the Jewish connotations of these figures. And this was not entirely arbitrary or incidental because, of course, Jews also played an important role in this new discipline of sexology. Uh, we might think of um, Wilhelm Fleiss, we might think of Sigmund Freud, of course, and also Magnus Hirschfeld, who actually also participated in one of the landmark, um, the first gay film um, ever to be made in 1919, different from the others, uh, also made by a Jewish filmmaker, by the way. Um, so Jews played an important role as both agents and image um, in the discourse on sexology. Uh, and implicit moments of race, sex, and the monstrous then arose in many of the landmark films of the era. Again, we've mentioned, um, and these are not necessarily monster films, although they have some connotations of the monster sometimes. Uh, different from the others, for example, if we think of the raccoon, look um, of Konrad Veit's character uh, who had previously played the, or, or would come to play, or had played the, um, uh, the uh, monster in um, Caligari, but also maybe a film where we wouldn't uh, think of monstrous implications, uh, Girls in Uniform of 1931, um, where we also have allusions to the, the vamp or the, va vamp, the vampire, the vamp as vampire, uh, in the uh, very famous staircase scene um, and the um, play of shadow and light uh, in the, throughout the film, but in this sequence in particular. Um, these two films differ from the others and Girls in Uniform, both made by Jewish directors, both um, defending um, homosexuality, gay, gay men, gay men and lesbian desire um, as, um, against the discourse of pathology that was attached to them, bracketed this era, one in 1919, the other in 1931, uh, not long before the Nazis rise um, to power. And uh, Oswald's film, different from the others in particular, um, was um, very, very scandalous at the time. It drew a, a huge public debate around um, sexual representation. And uh, in fact, the film was uh, attacked um, for being the work of a Jewish director and therefore uh, indulging in these unsavory uh, themes, homosexuality. Um, and it was after this, after this film, after Oswald's film, uh, different from the others in 1919, that film censorship was reintroduced. And this is where Monsters became an important medium, an important vehicle to uh, signpost these uh, sexual meanings that now had to be sublimated, that had to be um, represented in more uh, symbolic ways. So um, 
yeah, that's where I want to uh, take off with um, the golem, uh, which is not made in 1920, so not long after, in fact, film censorship was reintroduced. And I will share my screen and show you a clip and talk to you about Vigna's Golem. So um, Vigna's Golem film, The Golem, how he came into the world, it was in fact his third Golem film. Vigna had made uh, two attempts, uh, previous attempts to film the Golem material. They are uh, overall lost. So we have some uh, uh, stills and we have uh, some, some snippets of film, but the film, these films, they were quite short. Uh, they have been overall lost. And it was only uh, Vigna's a third attempt, the Golem, how he came into the world, uh, which has been uh, preserved. And it of course drew on the longstanding popularity of the Golem in German speaking popular culture. Um, some of you may know this, but for those who don't, I will talk a little bit about the, um, the history of, of the Golem. Uh, it's often thought of as a Jewish figure, and of course it is a figure um, that first arose in the, as in the, with the term golem that first arose in the med medieval uh, Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. But in fact, the golem story uh, that we know today, even though it was also then adapted by Jewish playwrights and uh, Jewish filmmakers and then Jewish novelists as well, um, in many ways is, um, a Christian story about Jews, at least in the way in which it emerges uh, in the early 19th century. It is a story that is first uh, related, told in that way by Christian writers and becomes embellished by Christian writers. So they, uh, pro they draw on Jewish sources, but they begin to embellish this, um, this figure of the golem with particular narrative details that actually are very much um, convey the, the Christian view of the Jew as, as monstrous, as scary, as, um, uh, as not, not quite human, resembling human, but not being human, which is of course the um, enlightenment discourse on outsiders at the time and the Jews in particular, but not just the Jews, uh, but the Jews as one group of um, outsiders to enlightenment discourse. Um, so the, Conflict deriving from the medieval conceptions of absolute otherness of the Jews uh, as being inscribed on the body and the enlightenment ideal of universality um, expressed themselves in the ever more ambiguous function of the monstrous since 1800 more generally. So the Jews, the golem's difference, and this resembles the enlightenment discourse on the assimil assimilated Jews, uh, lies in its essence rather than in clearly demarcated physical features. Externally, the golem could be mistaken for um, a real life person, even though of course it is larger than life. And so we, we know that it is a monster, that it's not a human. Um, but medieval monsters were much more clearly uh, figures of horror, whereas the golem bears the much more subtle implications of Freud's uncanny, um, the Freud's uh, famous essay on the uncanny, which was not incidentally written in 1919, the year that also uh, uh, Caligari was made, the year in which um, German, early German cinema's monsters Weim became Weimar cinema's monsters and assumed a kind of a new saliency and a new also artistic um, guise. This uh, uh, uncanny in Freud derives from the boundary zone between the known and the unknown. And the Jew, of course, the assimilated Jew is also in the eye of the uh, non-Jewish world around him, something, a, a figure that is familiar, but is also unfamiliar in, in uh, racist discourses, for sure, and anti-Semitic discourses, the assumption that assimilated Jews may externally look like everyone else, uh, but inside, biologically, they are, we know that they are different. So uh, in a sense, this renders the Jew the uncanny figure per se uh, could be argued. And this is in fact also uh, Julie Kristeva's argument in her uh, essay on horror. Uh, what is interesting about Wigner's film is that it highlights the unstable meanings of the monster 
And uh, therefore the critical reception of the film has historically oscillated between praise for Wigner's largely empathetic and historically accurate portrayal of medieval Jewish life and charges of anti-Semitism on the other hand. Uh, and in fact, uh, Wigner's filmic portrayal of the Jew are uh, largely ambivalent, but nonetheless, it is also a, a very a popular film that has a, a lasting uh, fascination for audiences. And I think it's precisely this ambivalence in the film uh, and also that uh, Wegener casts uh, the Jew as this ambivalent uh, signifier of aesthetic modernism, which makes the reading of the film um, much more uh, complex than simply reducing it to a filmic expression of anti-Semitism. So it draws its particular emotive power from the doubled or heightened effect of portraying the Jew on screen which it filters through a dazzling visual aesthetic. I will show you uh, an example in the moment. Um, starting here from this image of darkness, um, uh, which I've kind of chosen quite uh, deliberately because um, Wigner conceived a film as uh, he calls it in an essay, um, kinetic poetry. And um, he sees the rhythm of film, this is a silent film, of course, um, at the time, um, encapsulated and editing is also still very much in the kind of its nascent stages, but he sees this kinetic poetry um, uh, reflected in the, in the movement of light and shadow, uh, in the rhythm of light and shadow uh, in, uh, in this early film. Um, and uh, he kind of uses the, mon the, the monster, the golem, and also the, the figure of the Jew more broadly as symbols of this kinetic poetry um, to signify the special artistic potential of film. And I want to show you uh, one of the two prayer sequences from the film to illustrate both the, how the Jew represents um, both this kinetic poetry, the, the uh, rhythm of um, shadow and light, and how the uh, figure of the Jew in the film comes to represent this. these images without um, the score, because of course the score is a, is a contemporary score. Um, there was no score um, composed uh, specifically for, for this film, so it was played with different uh, scores historically. Um, this is different from Nosferatu because uh, Morno, when he made Nosferatu, he kind of saw it as, a, as an absolute work of art, and so there, there the score is kind of composed uh, specifically for the film. But here the kinetic poetry uh, derives for Wigner not only from the changes in darkness and light and through the rhythmic flow of and speed of images, but also as he contended in an essay, um, but through the rhythmic changes in the image of the Jew that these technical aspects produce. Images of surprising dignity, beauty, and individuality, such as that of Leuve, uh, Rabbi Leuf placed at the center of the screen and bathed in light while studying his books, Contrast with the dark and jagged silhouettes of the ghetto's houses huddled together as though in communion and frequently <clears throat> contorted shapes of the Jewish masses inhabiting the streets. Stunning visual beauty also marks this prayer scene where the upward and downward flow of prayer movement interplays with the stark lighting that lets the praying bodies emerge from the dark. In moving from lightness, from lifeless to animation, the golem itself functions as the tangible expression of Wegener's kinetic poetry. And Wegener, in fact, in the film casts Louvre as a symbol of the artist and the action, in fact, the filmmaker as artist, because there's this incredible scene where um, um, he takes the golem uh, to the palace to persuade uh, the emperor uh, to not, not to expel the Jews. 
um, and we see the the, pa the palace um, uh, falling down. But before that, um, uh, Rabbi Louv actually projects moving images onto the wall, and he because he tries to um, sort of uh, show or or educate the emperor on the history of the Jews and how Jews have historically been. Uh, expelled, so he casts um, images of the exodus from Egypt onto the palace wall, which is, is a, a, in fact, a screen uh, projection. Um, so Leuf uh, is a symbol of the artist and the autonomous force of the artist's work. Um, and this is also highlighted through the many theatrical references in the film, um, accomplished Feinhardt actors uh, from the Deutsches Theater, the German um, theater and the highly artistic sets, which are sort of um, theatrical references in the film, uh, which also challenged the prevailing dismissal of cinema at an art, as an art form, which was very prevalent at the time. The most problematic aspects in the film uh, may actually derive from its treatment of the, the Jewish woman. Um, there, uh, the film seems to fall quite uh, clearly and strongly into stereotypes about um, Jewish women and uh, female sexuality, but Jewish, fe Jewish uh, female sexuality in particular. Um, and we see the, the Jewish woman in the film, Miriam, the rabbi's daughter, as a, a transgressive figure. Of course, the golem is an act of transgression as well, because um, uh, humans are not really meant to emulate God and, tr and creating life from this human-like shape is is emulating God's uh, creation of humans. So the, the golem itself is already in, uh, an image of transgression. And in, in Miriam, this becomes um, the dangers of this transgression become evident because she is involved with in a relationship with a Christian knight. Um, so uh, here we have the danger of, in the uh, language of the time, uh, miscegenation. Um, and um, the golem kind of signifies this potential for unlawful hybrid creation, which is also reflected in Miriam's liaison with the Christian. Uh, so let's have a look at, sorry, um, at um, one of the kind of um, highlights in the film when uh, the rabbi's helper discovers that uh, Miriam is having uh, this relationship with the Christian knight. He discovers them together and he awakens the golem and uh, sends him to, um, well, to kill the knight effectively. He makes him kill the knight. Um, so this, um, in this moment here that uh, where the clip starts, um, Miriam and the rabbi's helper, the, fa the familist climb uh, upstairs in the tower and they see that the golem has actually thrown the knight uh, off a tower and the knight is dead and they're obviously horrified and shocked at what happens. Um, and then, but now the golem also comes to uh, call Miriam to order. <laughs> Thank you. 
so this is a, a beautifully uh, restored version of the film. The older uh, versions that were available on VHS or on DVD um, were just black and white. But in fact, um, when these films were shown at the time, they, they were tinted, they had uh, color, colors like that, and the colors were supposed to convey different moods. So green was fear and red was, was danger and blue was night. Um, we'll see that also in the uh, Nosferatu uh, clip that I'll show in a moment. Um, that has also been restored and is, is tinted in these colors. Uh, so the golem here serves as an ambiguous sign of the destructive consequences of untamed male desire and masculinity as the reordering principle. And the uh, film's message is therefore ultimately conservative, calling for a reinstatement of the sexual, ethnic, religious, and gendered bounds, which it originally or initially undermines. Miriam as the dark and seductive Jewish woman, as we've said, complies uh, most clearly with the anti-Semitic stereotype, the film de siècle image of the Jewish femme fatale, which uh, we find in so many texts at the time and which was comprised um, most memorably in Otto Weininger's uh, seminal sex and character of 1903. Uh, and the Christian women, this emerges particularly uh, clearly in the contrast with the Christian women in the film at the emperor's court who are chased, the blonde chased and shying away from the golden's advances. Um, and also in the, the blonde girls in white dresses at the end of the film um, who signify innocence and virginity, even though one girl offers the golem uh, an apple, which implies the danger of temptation emanating from all femininities. So the film seems to suggest that the transgressing the boundaries between Jews and Christians, um, maybe this, this image here at the end of the, the scene when the golem burns down the ghetto is symbolic of the idea of a, of, of a rift and that transgressing these boundaries between Jews and Christians is fraught with deadly consequences. So the knight Florian has to die at the hands of the golem because he has sought love from a Jewish woman in the ghetto, while the golem is, itself is destroyed when it steps beyond the ghetto walls. Uh, the person who isn't uh, empowered in the film, the character is the normative Jewish male. So the, the famulus, the rabbi's helper, who's also in love with Miriam and um, who, as long as he stays in the space inside the ghetto with the other Jews, uh, the social space assigned to him is kind of empowered. So he actually gets Miriam at the end um, and the rabbi who leads the other Jews in their triumphant return of the golem's lifeless body uh, into the ghetto then represents the victorious patriarchal order and its separation of the races. Uh, a film that's perhaps a lot more messy um, and perhaps doesn't quite uh, leave us with these same reassurances is in fact uh, Monos Nosferatu. Um, the first vampire movie uh, of all times uh, made in 1922 um, and I, I've already mentioned that it was also, uh, uh, Mono imagined it as a kind of a Wagnerian total work of art, Gesamtkunstwerk, um, and so it also had a, a score, um, the score that you're going to hear, in fact, especially composed for it. So again, when you uh, watch older versions, they don't actually include the original score because that was also lost uh, for a while, but the recent restored version now has it. Um, and although the film makes no explicit reference to Jewishness, it implicitly evokes the mythology and the visual iconography of anti-Semitism. And in doing so, uh, it arguably ranks among the most pro problematic film among the films of that period. Um, and you'll see this in the clip uh, that I'll show in a moment. So for example, when Mona frequently focuses on the vampire's profile, highlighting the vampire's large hooked nose uh, as both through the, um, the camera position and through the lighting, uh, the hook nose, of course, being the unmistakable sign of the racialized Jewish body. Uh, these are among the most problematic moments uh, in the film. Um, also, the Jewish connotations that he's giving the monster uh, are not incidental because they're already present in Bram Stoker's novel of Dracula of 1897. Um, so while the film could not be called Dracula Monos film because uh, Mona wasn't able to get the rights uh, to, to call to, to sort of make an explicit um, uh, Dracula version, it is only, it's a very uh, thinly disguised um, 
version of Dracula. So the, the names have been changed, the uh, place names have been changed, the characters' names have been changed, but it, the film follows um, the plot of, of Dracula fairly closely. And here too, um, the vampire is not explicitly made Jewish, but has uh, a number of uh, connotations which, which um, fit in very well with anti-Semitic discourses on the Jews. Um, so for Mono, um, uh, this Mono's implication, implication of Nosferatu, as we said, follows uh, Stoker, uh, where the vampire, for example, comes from the orientalized lands of the East with its mixed populations, um, with an, being an admixture of European races, this is actually a quote from um, Stoker, with an admixture of Asian and African blood, and of course the reference of blood in the vampire um, is a reference to how vampires feast on the blood of other people, but it is also, and it, and it is also a racial reference, uh, because of course the image of the Jew is also that the Jew um, is, is intent on, this is Chamberlain's argument about the Jews, intent on miscegenating um, the European races um, and um, sort of seep, seeping into the body of the, of the European races through these kind of, through, through sex. And um, the vampire in, in biting and biting necks, for example, being a, a favorite um, location for the vampire to bite, the, uh, the sexual imagery is also, um, or, or the sexual illusions are also uh, there. Um, yes, uh, and Stoker's uh, Dracula has deep burning eyes, uh, has a long brown beard and a great black hat, uh, which evokes the dress code of the Eastern Jew of stereotype, uh, which we also see in uh, Nosferatu, but with a twist. Um, so I will show you the clip and uh, talk a little bit about the the twists uh, in the evocation of the Jew here. This is um, the scene where the protagonist, uh, Harker, who has traveled to Nosferatu's uh, castle, uh, meets Nosferatu for a midnight dinner in Nosferatu's castle. <laughs> if you've noticed it, but the vampire here uh, becomes a vehicle uh, for the pursuit of queer desire. 
And these constellations are read as far more complex once the monster's racialized implications are inserted. For the ambivalence of Monos Nosferatu emerges in no small degree from its intersecting and conflicting meanings of sexual pleasure, queer pursuit or pursuit of queer desire, and anti-Jewish displeasure, the monster, the uh, vampire with its Jewish connotation being, uh, connotations also being shown as disgusting. Uh, so this scene, scene, scene uh, through in, uh, in this film uh, seems to highlight the allegorical function of intersecting Jewish and queer signifiers to ambivalently signpost the other or these multiple others in modernity. And these intersecting meanings are quite neatly contained in the phallic implications of the bleeding thumb, which you've seen in the sequence, which arouses Count Orlok's uh, vampiric desire and leads to his pursuit of Hutta, the human protagonist. Um, the bleeding thumb suggesting uh, gay male sexuality and the sucking of the thumb in particular, which the vampire seeks to do, but also the Jewish ritual of Jewish circumcision on the other hand, and these meanings are by no means mutually exclusive, but ultimately feed into the anti-Jewish imagination, which linked castrate circumcision to presumed castration and the effeminate nature of the Jew, an image with its own homosexual implications. So the resulting conflation of sexuality and horror of pleasure and displeasure in this image of the Jew has precisely come to mark the instability of anti-Semitic discourse and the discourse of otherness more generally. And I now want to turn to, yeah. sorry, to my final example. And this is uh, the Danish director's German film of 1932, Vampire, which is kind of an anti-Nosferatu. Um, it was in fact the first um, horror film that I ever watched when I was quite young and I found it extremely terrifying and it haunted me for many years and I decided to come back and study it uh, and I found it very very interesting um, thematically and um, uh, I was and again it sort of leaves the Jewish connotations implicit but perhaps because they are implicit maybe all the more powerful or all the more suggestive um, but here the figure with the Jewish connotation seems to emerge as the kind of positive um, figure in the film, the productive figure in the film, who rescues um, a, a, the place that they come to from the, a female vampire um, who um, uh, feeds on the blood of, of a young uh, woman. Uh, so here we have a kind of a, a vampire with, with lesbian uh, connotations. Um, and here, this, um, these events seem to function as a warning sign of the uh, fruitful root of the old, the old regime, uh, which is still there and whose uh, minions and whose monsters are haunting uh, the present. So in the film, there's a drifter called Alan Gray, who discovers uh, during his ramblings a village where this nightly this vampire uh, comes nightly to visit on a uh, to, to a young a diseased young uh, girl and is slowly corrupting her slowly turning her into a vampire and this is a vampire uh, the as a, who is an elderly woman with aristocratic demeanor um, who kind of seems a member of the uh, upper class uh, and I have a longer clip actually from from this film but it's, it is so watchable that um, I hope you don't think I indulged sharing a longer clip with you. Um, so um, what you'll see in the clip is um, this drifter, Alan Gray, um, he kind of, this, he's, he's, he's searching for the, for, the, for the vampire because of course he wants to destroy the vampire. And um, he's, he seems to kind of, in a, in a kind of daydream or in, in a night, in a kind of nightmare, um, he has visions of himself. I'll leave it there and, show, and share the clip with you. Thank you. 
And there she is. This is the vampire. Yeah. So um, now he knows who, who she is and he will go out and find her. As you as you may have noticed, um, maybe uh, this is actually not a silent film. It is one of the well, of course, sound at the, from 1927 sound film uh, comes in. Uh, this is a this is is still it's on the cost between sound silent and sound film. So even though sound film exists and is being made and is becoming commercially successful, and we hear sound, of course, we hear the working and there are tiny bits of dialogue. It is edited sound, uh, but it is used very sparingly. The film is really made uh, in the logic of a silent film, and um, most of its meanings are conveyed through um, through editing. Uh, so it really takes you know Eisenstein's Patyomkin and the lessons of editing on, on board to convey its, its meanings through the, the movement of, and the putting together of images. Also, uh, the relatively new um, technology of superimposing images um, to kind of create the kind of ghostly atmosphere. Um, so it is quite interested also, interested also in the technology, the film, the new film technologies of the time and, and editing becoming um, ever more uh, refined in the films of that period. Uh, so Alan Gray's uh, dark features and dreamy somnambulic portrayal um, evoke the image of the Jew and his alternative masculinity, which are here connoted positively. Uh, and of course, and when we hear um, Alan Gray, maybe we think of Dorian Gray and the image of Dorian Gray, so the kind of multiple allusions here, I think, also to this alternative masculinity 
possibly. And in the film, it is this type alone which is able to effectively counter the destructive forces of an outlived society uh, by detecting the root of this danger and staving it off for good. If you notice the, the references to World War I also, uh, this figure who, uh, puts, who puts the lid on the coffin is wearing a uniform, is, um, uh, has lost a leg, is obviously a maimed uh, soldier. Uh, so this is kind of this, uh, these allusions to a society that is kind of outlived but is rearing its head again and needs to be uh, staved off, which uh, um, Alan Gray succeeds in. So um, even in reversing the monstrous connotations of the non-Jew and the, the Jew, uh, Dryas film, of course, ultimately upholds the notion of uh, their essential difference, which had been driving the logic of early German film between 1914 and 1932. And in that sense, it is not separate from um, the anti-Semitic discourses uh, at the time, but it, it inverts uh, the stereotype, but kind of seems to leave the, the dichotomies int intact in certain ways. Um, so from their monsters through more subli sublimated portrayals of the uncanny, Weimar films offer us a rare opportunity to uncover the ambivalences uh, in the destroyed legacy of Jewish participation in all aspects of pre-1933 German society, including the role of Jews as gender and sexual rights uh, pioneers. I pointed to Oswald and uh, Sagan and their uh, respective films uh, different from the others and Girls in Uniform, which kind of bracketed uh, this period uh, and also symboled the, the beginning and the end of the sexual enlightenment films. Both directors <laughs> were gender and sexual rights uh, pioneers and uh, maybe fin to finish off with them, uh, they both personify this particular moment uh, in Weimar history and Weimar film um, by self-consciously attempting to refashion this tainted image of the Jew as a racial, gender, and sexual deviant into a cosmopolitan plea for sexual equality and also the equality of Jews, of course, with that. It was this legacy which National Socialism widely destroyed, but which we can detect in all its ambivalence and all its glory in the vivacity of the Weimar monsters. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Kathy, for this um, absolutely mesmerizing, um, we might call it guided tour into the realm of monsters lurking in Weimar cinema and the different connotations um, in their appearance, agency and the way the characters related to each other. We are now going to open um, the Q&A session and whoever would like to ask a question, could you please put your name in the main chat box at the bottom of um, your screen and we will unmute you to let you ask your question that Kathy will um, respond to in order of appearance. So anyone who would like to follow up on a particular aspect of um, this talk, please feel free to add your names and we will um, call upon you to, to speak. Yes, Christina is... Um... Yeah, I thought I would break the ice. Thank you very much for this fascinating lecture and I really enjoyed watching those film clips. I had never no idea that they tinted them originally. That was fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the beauty and the uh, maybe seductive beauty or the ugly, ugliness in the monsters that you um, showed us. Um, is the mm, non deviant so the patriarchal or righteous or morally, um, morally positive figure, always beautiful? Um, are there also instances of ambivalent or ugly um, figures that uphold the right gender order? And um, is there a particular, are there particular traits that show the seductive beauty of deviance or, or, you know, that make, that make these figures attractive as well in the ambivalence that you mentioned? Because in the clips that you showed, it really looked as if the vampires were, and, and you know, these monsters were really quite ugly. Hmm. 
Well, maybe that's in the, in the eye of the beholder, though, um, because uh, arguably uh, Nosferatu is extremely ugly, but maybe Nosferatu is extremely ugly if you're familiar with the anti-Semitic iconography of the Jew and you kind of sense the implications of this figure. But um, I would argue that as a queer spectator, uh, you may be able to behold, if not beauty, then an allure um, in the vampire's pursuit of his, um, of, of Hutta. Um, are, the, are the vampires always old? Because they seem to be quite a lot older than their beautiful young victims. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if they're always old, but in these, in these films, certainly there's the uh, Nosferatu, the old, old man, and in uh, Vampire, it's the old, the old woman, the older woman. She is in fact an old woman who's feeding on, on the young um, yeah, but but I would say, even though, as, as I've uh, indicated, I'm, uh, Nosferatu kind of fits into the idea of ugliness and the Jew as ugly, I would say that he also exerts a, a fascination, a peculiar fascination. And, um, if, and again, this is actually a soundtrack that was a score that was composed for the film. Um, uh, in this moment um, where he approaches Hutta and he says to him, I'm sorry that this was in, in German due to the film copy I had um, the title, but um, he says to him, my, my beloved, uh, shouldn't we uh, stay a little longer together un until sunrise, effectively saying to him, um, you know, should let's spend the night together. Um, and the music kind of turns quite romantic for a moment uh, in, in that in that moment. So I think there are ways in which, um, again, it's it's ambivalent. Uh, yes, he is, he's meant to look like an ugly old man, but he also has quite alluring qualities uh, to him, which arguably make him more fascinating than, for example, the uh, American uh, film Dracula, which is a, a universal horror film of 1934, where um, Dracula is much more conventionally kind of good looking. So maybe here you have an example of the, the bad guy being sort of more conventionally attractive. I mean, Bela Lugosi as a, a vampire in, uh, as Dracula, in fact, in the film, in the Hollywood film, is, is, is quite sort of conventionally good looking, which maybe in some ways is supposed to heighten the allure to a kind of conventional audience. But I think the interesting thing is that different audiences might see these figures in, in different ways and might kind of evaluate what is attractive about them in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, thank you, Kathy. We have got, um, I, I have a couple of questions, but we have a comment from um, Tiki Martel that says it reminds one of the Nazi films introducing the ugly Jew to the pure Aryans. Um, Tiki, would, would you like to um, ask anything in addition to that or just have a comment on, on the statement? Oh, hold on, I, I, have to, I have to unmute you. Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, I think sadly it does. It does. That's all I want to say. Mm -hmm. The image of the Jew, the image it's still there, the absolutely. big nose. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, again, by, show, by showing the, the vampire, by kind of sort of mixing this, the sexual and the uh, racial connotations, it both fits into anti-Semitic discourse quite neatly, uh, with the Jews being seen as effeminate, uh, as trans sexu transgressive in every respect, including uh, sexuality. Um, being seen as corrupt, um, but at the same time, I think there is this element of, of, of ambivalence also in the in the queering of of, uh, Dr of Dracula. Again, it's, it maybe depends on which which lens you have you have on when you when you watch it. Um, but absolutely, I mean, the Nazi films borrowed their iconography from so many different films, and they certainly borrowed their iconography from the Golem film. Uh, they borrowed their iconography uh, from Nosferatu, and they they borrowed. I mean, they didn't invent anything new. They borrowed from you know from all of the, from all of these films, yeah. particularly the the ideas of degeneracy and corruption attached yeah. to the Jewish type in these films. Yeah. Also, 
uh, they probably they were influenced by the films uh, of Charles, uh, the stories of Charles Dickens. Absolutely, yes. I mean, yeah. Charles Dickens' Jewish protagonists uh, form an important part of the uh, 19th century uncanny imagination of the Jew, which is already present before Dickens in, in the British Gothic. Um, and which Dickens then kind of literalizes in a new way and which underpin a lot of these uncanny uh, representations. Absolutely. Yes. Um, absolutely agreed. Forgetting that uh, the Jews were a culture they read and, um, and they, um, they were philosophers, mathematicians, um, doctors, when Western Europe was illiterate and starving. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, the Jews formed a large part of the kind of cultural sphere um, in that time, and especially during the interwar period in, in German culture. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. We have got an, another um, comment from um, Molly Harabin, who um, says she cannot speak herself, but she was wondering if Kathy could reflect some more on the merging of queer desire and anti-Jewishness in Nosferatu. I'm thinking perhaps it indicates an internalized self-hatred taking into account Murnau's own sexuality, which he did not reveal whilst alive to my knowledge." End quote. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think mm, that would maybe lead us to speculate about Murnau and his intentions. Um, I think in his in his circles, Mona was quite known uh, to have relationships with with other men and with uh, young young men in particular. So um, he was not what we would call nowadays out. But then, um, I mean, hardly hardly anybody was at at the time. So whether that's whether that's the same as self hatred or whether that's a kind of a form of social adaptation. Um, to, to what extent that kind of uh, reflects on uh, how somebody feels about themselves. It's, it's a kind of slightly contentious link to make. Um, I think the argument I was trying to make about the film and about these films more generally is because um, Auschwitz, different from the others, brought, or the, the response uh, to Auschwitz, uh, different than the others, brought back a film censorship and sexual meanings were no longer uh, it was no longer possible to show sexual meanings in an explicit way, Spe specifically um, homosexual meanings. I'll just use the language of the time. Queer meanings, we would call it now. Um, the monster was one of the figures where this could be done because it kind of enabled filmmakers to bypass censorship. So um, rather than seeing uh, Nosferatu as, a, as an expression of self-hatred, I, I would argue Nosferatu is a vehicle for queer desire um, which, as a you know, queer audiences might still relish in and and find um, you know if maybe ambivalently pleasurable. But all, I think, all um, horror is if we do find horror pleasurable, if people do find it pleasurable, it is always an ambivalent pleasure because it kind of navigates this um, zone between pleasure and disgust, uh, effectively. Um, I would say that Nosferatu stages these, the, the character, in the character of Nos Nosferatu, these aspects are much more staged than just kind of uncritically reflected because they are so fractured uh, through the different um, meanings attached to the figure that no, no one of these meanings is explicitly clear. And this kind of leaves them, leaves them kind of fractured and leaves precisely these gaps uh, this fracturing leaves these gaps from which spectatorial pleasure can still uh, arise. Okay, um, yes, thank you. And Kathy, I have got two questions, if, if I may um, ask them. The first one relates directly to the, to the Weimar period. And I wonder whether we have any um, sources like diary entries or letters that reflect about these movies that give us an insight into how um, the German Jewish community felt about them, how they engaged with them, um, and what kind of meaning they derived at the time. And the second question is com 
completely different. Um, when when I look at the, especially the um, clip from Nosferatu that you played, it comes to my mind that we have recently quite a few children's films that dwell on this visual stereotype of Nosferatu quite clearly, but they turn it upside down. And I'm thinking about um, the, the series um, Hotel Transylvania, where you have got this um, single father who is protecting his vampire child from society. And I wonder how these, these visual stereotypes, how they function in a contemporary setting and um, how they travel through time. So the monsters are actually the good ones who are who are threatened now. And um, what what would you make of that? Or I'm I'm not sure whether you have you have seen any of this. I'm quite exposed due to having a child of of that age, but it's it's kind of fascinating to see the visual patterns being turned upside down, and to still have kind of a um, or not to still, but to have like a very clear positive connotation of of a Jewish family in there in one way or another. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first part of your question about how these films were received by, by Jewish audiences, I think there's probably some real historians work to be done to be done here. But mm -hmm. I think um, the, uh, the Golem film was much generally much more positively uh, received because it does seem to convey, even though it is also ambivalent, but it does seem to convey a much more uh, beautiful and um, you know, productive image, seemingly productive image of the Jew. Then Nos I mean Nosferatu. When we look at Nosferatu, we see we see degeneracy and we see the anti-Semitic stereotype, even though as I try to argue, I think there's also a way in which this the film doesn't just reflect or reiterate the stereotype. It's sort of um it all it also stages it in ways that makes make it evident as a stereotype. Think in the clip um of the moment where uh we see Nosferatu holding up, we see him kind of holding up a piece of paper. And which obscures on the one hand his profile, but when you look what is actually on that sheet, there's sort of various, um, it looks like hieroglyphs, uh, and there's a, there's a swastika there, and there's sort of various references to contemporary discourses. So it's, it's both, it is an image of the Jew, but it's also about the image of, of the Jew. So I think that's, that's where it is kind of more, more complex than just reading it as that um, sort of a, a flat, reiteration of the anti-Semitic stereotypes. But um, certainly, uh, yes, the anti-Semitic um, connotations of many of these images uh, is, is troubling uh, to us. Um, and uh, as you've um, suggested, and, and I think that can be argued for horror uh, much more broadly. I mean, at the time, these weren't horror films because the uh, the term horror didn't actually exist as a as a genre term yet. It was coined uh, by Universal Horror in the 1930s to market uh, Dracula and 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 all the horror films, Werewolf, and all, all those horror films that we know um, as horror films from the 1930s, and which kind of drew on the early German films, um, were were sometimes made also with people who had involved been involved in the making of these early films as art films in Germany in the 1920s and had fled had either gone to Hollywood in the 1920s or fled to Hollywood after the Nazis came to power and then kind of started to make uh, B-movies B and, and, and kind of partly horror films there. So the, the, the themes and styles kind of transferred, but they, but they also changed. They also changed. Um, what we see in more recent years and probably since the 1980s increasingly onwards is a kind of, one could argue, almost inversion of these Mm -hmm. um, the stereotypes of, that the monsters um, represent, maybe this kind of links to, to Christina's question as well, whether we also see kind of, do we see beautiful bad people and, and ugly good people? Um, I think with the, with the advent of, of postmodernism and also um, critical interrogation of stereotypes and previously disenfranchised groups kind of assuming voices in mainstream culture and also being involved in the making of these films oftentimes um, these these monsters are kind of coming they're kind of coming to bite back they're biting back at the audiences that kind of um, want to see them in the old stereotypical way so in a way there's an inversion of this of the stereotypes that ha that's happening in a lot of the, the, the these horror films where 
the, the figures that were previously the awful monsters are actually the, in a way this goes back to, you know, um, enlightenment discourse about the Jews. They, they are these, these, these figures that are still sympathetic, that were meant, that were still kind of, you know, um, that deserve our empathy and pity. But now uh, they, they're not just being, they don't just deserve our empathy and pity. They're actually assuming agency and, and coming back to kind of to haunt uh, the society that has turned them into these monsters effectively. So, yeah, I think that's, that's an, it's an interesting moment. And I don't know if we can call it a, um, a redeeming moment in, in the horror genre. It's probably, that would be too, um, too, too general because a lot of the misogyny in the horror genre is has remained unchanged even though that has changed a little bit as well but that seems to be a much more dominant kind of um strand still than the kind of the racialized monsters being the being the bad guys hmm. okay yeah thank you kathy it, it, there's certainly so much to more to, to to think about in in that respect um I'm I'm quite triggered by by the images you used today, and and I hope um, everybody else took away some food for thought. Before we close, I would just like to ask: Do we have any other questions anyone would like to ask? We still have a couple. I have of another little one, if I can. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, I'm abusing my my privilege here. Um, I wanted um, to ask whether these films are really still that powerful because you mentioned several times um, in the beginning and also in the end of your talk how enduring the uh, the legacy of those films is uh, till today but actually you know um, how many of us have actually seen parts of those films or the films and um, I think like um, there are other films which probably in today's popular culture are referenced a lot more and maybe it's only a small arcane group of film critics and you know um, the people who really know about the history of film who um, still relate to these films um, or am I completely mistaken? Uh, well, I mean, these films are now, they are now uh, canonical films. I mean, they have become part of the, the canon of German film history, and they form the classics of, of early German film history. Uh, so in that sense, they are, they are deeply entrenched uh, in our understanding of what, um, you know, how, how German film kind of emerged and how it developed. But also, if you, if you watch horror films, uh, current recent horror films, uh, they keep borrowing from these early films, and that says a lot about the, the power of those early films. That they, um, you know, they're a res they've become a reservoir. They offer a reservoir of images, um, which filmmakers uh, keep using. So that too says something about their popularity. Yes, you probably have to go to university and to film school uh, to learn about these films to study them. Um, but I think once people do that, uh, they usually become quite quite mesmerized by them and fascinated by them. And I think that's that says something about. I mean, if you if you teach these films to um, to young people, who I mean don't even watch DVDs anymore, and um, you know, let alone a time where films were made on on celluloid and reels, and uh, directors wore white lab coats uh, when they when they were filming. Um, and these being silent films, black and white, I mean, this is so different from the viewing conventions of people today. But once you start delving into the films and exploring them, um, it, they do really grab, uh, you know, have the power to still grab uh, people as well. But I think it takes, uh, it probably takes an act of, of education to kind of convey that. Thank you. And are the pictures, uh, is, are the films still available freely? I mean, can you just go on YouTube and find Nosfer Nosferatu clips or is that not? Yes, you can, find the, you can find the full film uh, the, with tainted, tinted images on YouTube. You can find the Golem on YouTube. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you can even still buy the DVDs, but not, probably not for very long or the Blu-ray discs. So if you want those, probably have to do that fairly soon because they're going out of style very quickly. But yes, I mean, again, this is part of the reservoir of film history, uh, which is why they're, they're up there on YouTube. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, any any further questions from, from the audience? Anything else anyone would like to, to comment or ask? Okay, so I would like to say thank you to, to Kathy for your really absolutely fascinating talk. And also um, thank you to the team at the German Historical Institute. And of course, um, last but certainly not least, to um, my colleagues, um, Karina Clara Rowe, for all the work in organizing this event and in adjusting it last minute to the weather. Um, and of course, many thanks to, to all our guests who joined us tonight. We will be in touch with you shortly about our second lecture in the 2023 series that will be on Tuesday, the 4th of May with Nadia Wallmann speaking about the virtuous Jewess. And in the meantime, to um, keep you a bit busy, you can stay tuned for the next LBI London Film Club and that directly links to Christina's question. Um, we will be showing Paul Wegener's classic of the Weimar cinema, The Golem, how he came into this world. So I'll make sure to send you the link if you want to have a look. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. It was a very fascinating um, evening and we hope you enjoyed the event as much as we did. And yes, thank you very much. Goodbye everyone, have a good night and um, hopefully next time we see each other in person.